through the Balkans, we were approaching one of the great strategic crossroads of the world, the Straits of the Dardanelles and the Bosporus and the Sea of Marmara joining the Black Sea in the Mediterranean. This narrow, easily fortified ribbon separates Europe from Asia, and whoever controls these straits holds the key to Russia's Black Sea and the rich Ukraine, the breadbasket of Europe. The attempts of the Allies to wrest control of the straits from Turkey caused some of the fiercest fighting of the First World War. Here on the Bosporus lies the beautiful old city of Istanbul, toward which our caravan was headed. Coming into Istanbul, you feel the clash of ancient and modern ways. Now a republic, the government of Turkey is determined to transform this ancient land into an up-to-date Western nation. But it can't be done overnight, for the people still cling to the past. The streets of the old city are still steeped in the deep memories of yesterday, a yesterday of centuries. Probably no city in the world has had a more colorful history than Istanbul. Founded six centuries before Christ, it was then called Byzantium. A thousand years later, the Emperor Constantine made it the capital of the Roman Empire, and in his honor, it became Constantinople. And Constantinople it was for 1,600 years. Then in 1929, with the young Turks in power, it was rechristened, given the purely Turkish name of Istanbul. From the hills above the city, we looked down on a beautiful and peaceful harbor, but a harbor with an amazing past, Jason is said to have sailed here hunting the Golden Fleece. Here the Crusaders lingered on their way to the Holy Land. Pirate galleys swarmed these waters, and Eastern kings paid tribute to the ruling sultans. War after war has swept in bloody violence across these vital strategic straits separating Turkey and Europe from Turkey and Asia. And now warring powers are again turning toward Istanbul. Here the new and the old mingle on every side. Overlooking the blue waters of the Bosporus, is the palace of the last sultan of Turkey, now used by the president of the republic. The magnificent mosque of Otakoy is only one of the many reminders that we are now in a land of Muslim culture where God is Allah and Mohammed is his prophet. An ancient fortress guards the narrowest part of the Bosporus. Here Darius the Persian once built a wooden bridge to throw his conquering armies against the Greeks. There has been a lighthouse here for 2,000 years. First, only a blazing bonfire, now a modern electric beacon. Today, the star and crescent of Turkey wave over a land which looks to the west for ways of life that are new. But our caravan is headed east, where the roots of life still dig deep into the past. Leaving Istanbul, we loaded our motor caravan aboard a ferry boat for a six-hour trip across the Sea of Marmara. The pitching and tossing reminded us of some of the roads we'd been over, with the difference that this wasn't hard on our tires, just our stomachs. When we rolled off the ferry, we were on another continent, Asia, although still in Turkish territory. We were glad to be on solid ground again, and were soon on our way to the ancient metropolis of Bursa. Bursa was once a city of great importance in the Muslim world, and until 1453 was the capital of the Ottoman or Turkish Empire. Today it nestles sleepily against the foot of Mount Olympus, like an old man whose youth is gone, remembering its glory only in tradition and in the faded beauty of ancient mosques and tombs. We were entertained at lunch by a high-ranking Turkish official and his beautiful wife, Mr. and Mrs. Burhan Belge. They were fascinated by our modern motor caravan and asked us if we, in turn, would like to see a real Turkoman camel caravan. Of course, we said yes. So accompanied by them, we headed for southern Turkey in Asia and soon found out that the process of modernizing the country has not yet included the roads. Not this road, anyhow. And the further we went, the worse they got. No, we aren't throwing quoits. We're just putting in enough rocks so we can get past this stretch of mud. Probably the repair work we did will have to last that road for the next 50 years. In southern Turkey, our Atlas tires got a real chance to show how tough they were and believe your Uncle Larry, for this kind of work, you need tires that can really take it. From soft mud, we went to dry desert sand. Roads like these are plenty hard on heavy equipment, and we took no chances on being stuck far away from any help. Every thousand miles, regularly, we gave all our equipment a complete lubrication. In this dry desert country, 
where the engine sucked up quantities of gritty dust, we sometimes found it necessary to change oil even more frequently. An ox cart was passing with a Turkish family in it, and Peggy tried to make friends with the baby. The mother was as shy as the youngster. She still wears the veil, none of these modern ways for her. Finally, the lubrication job was finished and the trailer was reconnected. We were on our way again to find that Turkoman caravan. And it wasn't long before one appeared, coming slowly across the desert, like something brought to life out of the Arabian nights of old. Father is in the lead, looking for a camping place, and the eldest, unmarried daughter, has the place of honor leading the first camel, if you call that an honor. Or maybe you've never smelled a camel. The entire life of the nomadic tribes of the East centers around these strange bits of the desert. Since time immemorial, the camel has carried the wealth of Asia over the vast spaces of the East, from China all the way to Africa. The camels wear bells, like cowbells, only bigger. We recorded the sound of them as the caravan went by. Listen. A short time before sunset, the caravan stopped to make camp. We learned that this family of nomads was going to wait here for the coming of the eldest son. He had just been married and he was bringing home his bride. Papa decides on the right place to camp, but the women do most of the work. First, they unload all the caravan luggage. Tents, carpets, wearing apparel. Everything the family possesses is compactly rolled, packed so as to take the least possible amount of space. Mrs. Belgay translated Peggy's questions into Turkish. The women very cheerfully and quickly unpacked the rolls and hampers. It looked like an awful mess to us, like moving day back home. Imagine having to do this every day or so. But they didn't seem to mind at all. This is the kind of life they're born to and die in. The first and most important thing, apparently, is to get the head of the tribe properly settled on a nice, soft seat. Well, the theme song of the desert tribe seems to be, everybody works but father. When the old man is comfortably settled, mama takes charge of making camp. We noticed that each hamper was of a different design. That's to show what it contains. After a family consultation, during which the tent has been unpacked, it's time for everybody to join in the job of putting it up. Uh-oh, wait a minute, what's this? Don't tell me the head of the tribe is actually going to help. Maybe he's just showing off for the camera. No, no, he thinks better of it. After all, it's Papa who wears the pants. And I mean pants. The tent is spread out on the ground while the poles and ropes are arranged. It is made of black goat's hair and will keep out heat and rain, but not sand. There she goes, my house while you wait. The tools are the same as they used in the Stone Age. But believe me, these women certainly know the ropes. Bar she goes some more. Mama certainly keeps on the move around here. With the tent completely erected, we left the Turkoman family for the night. The next morning, bright and early, we found Mama starting the fire to cook breakfast. Here's the stove. And here's desert bread about to be baked. The dough is made from ground wheat and water. The recipe is simple, but the technique is not. It takes long practice to master that trick of rolling it on a stick to almost paper thinness. The technique of baking it takes a little practice, too. This is really fancy griddle cake juggling. And believe it or not, those oversized flapjacks are really good. Another breakfast item is cheese, churned from goat's milk. These people are simple and primitive, yet they always seem to be happy and self-sufficient. The girl who isn't helping get breakfast puts in her time making a rug. It is so closely woven that it's almost waterproof, and those colors will never fade. But what ho, here comes the bride and groom. Riding horseback is no treat for him, but she'd better make the most of it.
Today, she rides. Tomorrow, she walks. Come on, boy. Bring the gal along to meet the family. If she's going to spend the rest of her life with them, she might just as well get used to them now. They respectfully kiss Papa's hand. Parents are still honored by their children in Turkey. Mama welcomes her new daughter-in-law with a kiss in the heart. And why not? This makes one more good, strong gal to help do the chores. Then comes the wedding breakfast with a big platter of steaming hot goat's meat, eaten in the proper oriental way with fingers only. The groom took photographing in his stride, but the bride didn't find it so easy to face a motion picture camera. Well, maybe she doesn't look like a glamour girl to you, but with that red hair, believe me, she goes over big on the deserts of Turkey. We contributed some American-made dress goods to the bride and her new sisters-in-law as a wedding present, and we left them having a great time distributing them. We had to push on, so we said goodbye to our Turkmen friends, wishing the bride and groom happy honeymooning. Near the border of Syria, we entered a little native village that looks today as it has for a hundred years. We learned that here, there was going to be another wedding. This, a very fancy one. The bride being the daughter of the head man of the town. She was even then ready to leave her parents' house. But she obligingly waited until we set up our cameras. Then she kissed her father's hand and went out of the gate to meet the groom, followed by her sisters and bridesmaids. Here comes the wedding procession, headed by dancers who set the tempo for the villagers to follow. Notice the rhythmic grace of the leading dancer. Those who don't take part in the actual ceremonies watch from walls and rooftops. No wedding would be complete without this ceremonial dancing procession. Its strange, graceful rhythm goes back to pagan times, and it has never been changed, although its original meaning has long been forgotten. The bride is followed by horses carrying her dowry and household equipment. You can see that even if she weren't good-looking, she's well-equipped to be a good homemaker. The lucky groom walks proudly beside his bride, while the villagers sing the wedding chant that will ensure happiness. And the rosy-cheeked bride certainly looks happy now. The procession ended with a dance in the village square. It's a simple dance with no carpet cutting or jitterbugging, just the same the villagers get worked up as it goes on and on and keep time with clapping hands and stomping feet. Life goes happily on in this age-old country. Goes on as it has done for generation after generation. Still but little affected by changes that are sweeping over the newer lands to the west. And so we left them with the most heartfelt wish that their love story would end as all love stories should. Whether in the new world or the old. And they lived happily ever after.